Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1987 film, The Stepfather. And if anyone would say to me, hey, do you want to watch a movie about a murderous stepfather? I would say no. No, I don't. That doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound interesting. But this film, honestly, I think does kind of the best you could probably imagine with a premise like that, honestly. Uh, it sounds like such a boring premise, but the script writing and the uh, acting and the filmmaking just really came together, really makes it a pretty enjoyable film. And it's definitely one that I want to revisit because this was the first time I actually saw it. And I watched it on Shudder when I'm doing this review. So it was directed by Joseph Rubin, who also directed films like Sleeping with the Enemy, The Good Son, and Money Train. Those are just ones he's more known for. Uh, written by Donald E. Westlake, who also wrote scripts for Slayground, Stepfather 2, Make Room for Daddy, Stepfather 3, Payback. So um, put it in the comments, have you seen the second and third Stepfathers, and is it worth it? I'm assuming probably not, but go ahead and let me know. I think Terry O'Quinn is in the second one, but uh, I don't know about the third one. So yeah, let me know that information. So Terry O'Quinn actually plays Jerry in this film. Uh, he's phenomenal. Like, I mean, he is the reason to watch this film. I mean, I say that, but obviously I just said the script writing is really good. The filmmaking is really good. But honestly, like Terry O'Quinn is amazing. Like his performance is purely mesmerizing on the screen and I love it. And I think that's the main reason that people fall in love with this film is because he is magnetic on the screen. Like, you cannot look away from his performance. There's so much joy in there, even though he's such a horrible person character-wise. Um, so Terry O'Quinn's been in such films as, like, Silver Bullet, Young Guns, which I love Young Guns, Blind Fury, The Rocketeer, The Cutting Edge, Tombstone, love Tombstone, and Primal Fear. So... He's done a lot, lot more than that, and you probably, if you don't know him by name, you've probably seen him, at least from, like, some sort of TV show here or there. He gets a lot of work. It's still working, actually. So, uh, Westlake actually based the character of Stephanie in this film on his actual teenage stepdaughter, who he was kind of having a hard time getting along with. So, that's where the premise for this script came from, is the, just the kind of main idea of... You know, a person comes into the family from outside of it, and they feel like an outsider. So how much of an outsider are they really? And worst case scenario, they are a grifting murderer who finds an unsuspecting uh, widow and her daughter, moves in with them, creates a life, and then as soon as there's a little inkling of things not going exactly the way he wants, murders them, and then goes to start another life. It's, it's a great premise. Um, it, it plays really well. So Jill Sholin, who actually played Stephanie in this, claimed that she had nightmares because of the final scene when she's being chased by Jerry around the film. She literally said for weeks she was having nightmares of Terry O'Quinn chasing her. Um, speaks to um, how into the acting they were, how into those roles, and probably especially how into the role Terry O'Quinn was. The original script actually included flashbacks about Jerry's abusive childhood, which were actually supposed to signal how he kind of became a killer. Now, that said, uh, I do think it plays better without those scenes, in my opinion. In fact, the very beginning of this is probably the best, and I'll talk about... I'll talk. It's a great way to start the film. I'll talk about that in a second. The director... This is a really weird situation and messed up. The director of photography for this was replaced last minute, because he was arrested for a, his role in a domestic dispute. So a little close, a little too close to the actual material of this film. So that's like, that's a weird fact. Uh, so the opening shot of this is such a 80s clean, happy neighborhood, a typical, you know, suburban setting for the 80s. Then it goes to an unassuming house. And then it goes in and you're seeing Jerry in this unassuming house, in the bathroom, covered in blood, looking scruffy, and then he kind of methodically and emotionlessly cleans himself up, changes his appearance, cuts his hair, puts in contacts, changes his eye color, you know, all that stuff. And you're just kind of like, what is going on here? And then the big payoff scene, which is kind of like, whoa. Like, it really hits you at that point. And I think it's a wonderful way to start things. He comes down the stairs, and then they kind of pull back, and they show in the main room of the house just people murdered. And I believe it was just the mother and the daughter in there, just blood everywhere, everything's a wreck. 
just the aftermath of what he just did. And he just like calmly, coldly just walks right through basically. And it's just like, well, that's done. And this, it's so wonderful that this is the way they start the film because it sets up who Jerry is as a character messed up. And he has these two modes of like um, being outwardly appearing normal, but then inwardly being very conflicted, basically having two sides because he's nice at certain times and other times he just snaps and goes crazy. Uh, and then the fact that once he kills, he's, he's good with it. Like he feels a calm. He feels detached from the whole situation and he's ready to just move on so that's a great reason for it to be set up because you know who jerry is at that point but it's also a great setup because it comes back in the end when you get the sense that jerry's basically prepping to do exactly to susan and stephanie what he did to those people in the in the opening uh but i'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the end of the film but wonderful wonderful way to start um, Stephanie's leaf fight with her mom early on it does a good job of establishing that there's a very lighthearted, fun, close relationship there between Stephanie and Susan, which further uh, furthers the the purpose of of giving you the idea that um, he's stepping into Jerry's stepping into something that was really good, and he's trying to add to it for appearances basically, but really he's gonna tear it apart. Um, you immediately see Stephanie as, uh, it, sorry, you immediately see Stephanie is suspicious of Jerry when he gives her the puppy in the beginning and says, that's my girl. And just the look that she gives him back with that is kind of one of those, like, if looks could kill type situations. So that alone, I think kind of plays into the whole step, step parent situation. I don't think that's un uncommon, at least as far as, you know, TV and movies go. You know, I don't have any step parents in my life. I don't firsthand know what it's like to be a step parent or have one. But based off TV and movies, this is a very typical thing that they show you where there's always that tension. There's always that tough, uh, tough relationship from the get go, especially because the child is not wanting to have some strange random person come into their life. And obviously this film just takes those fears to the nth degree by saying, yes, this is worst case scenario that's going on for Stephanie. It appears Jerry is having a hard time keeping his family straight when he actually slips up and calls Stephanie Jill. That's at the part where he's showing a family because he's a realtor, showing them a house, and he's kind of pushing their daughter on a swing. And he's talking about his daughter and he says Jill and then he's just like, he kind of catches himself at that point. So that kind of lays the track for later when he's having a hard time keeping things straight, which is really what makes Susan catch on to what's actually going on and then finally drives him over the edge and he tries to kill her. So, um, yeah, so it's important that they kind of slip that in there as well. And that's one of the biggest things about this. They did such a good job with developing the story appropriately along the way so that it preps you for what's coming so that there's so many things that you're just like, oh, okay, I see why this is happening right now because they already kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. So wonderful. I love, love great script writing. I love the shots up the stairs from the basement when Jerry's walking or when he's just standing there and how like that shot upwards with how dark it is with a little bit of light coming through and like his silhouette it's so sinister. It's so foreboding. It is such a foreshadowing of who he is and who he who he's been, who he's going to be. Uh, it, it just looks great. I like how they show Jerry having emotionless sex. And then they cut over to Stephanie on the other side of the wall, which is what it seems is going on. Uh, you know, Jerry's having sex with Susan and they're that close up of his face. He looks like he's not enjoying it at all. He's just there to go through the motions. Uh, and then they go to Stephanie and she's in her room listening to music and the song lyrics say, run, baby, run. That is one of those moments of a nod to the audience to say, the characters don't know, but you know. And there is a lot of that type of, uh, that type of stuff written into the script, executed on screen, where it's this nod to the audience. And it's those cool moments where... As an audience member, it makes you feel powerless in the situation because you care about Susan. You care about Stephanie. And that ups the stakes even more because it gives you these hints of what's coming. And you know that there's something sinister behind it. You know that there's something more to what Jerry's saying, you know, cryptically speaking. 
but the characters don't catch on. And it just gets this feeling inside you of just like, oh my God, if you could only pick up on this. So it, it's great. It really sucks you in that way. The film has a lot of events and pieces of dialogue that mean something normal to the characters, but something different to the audience. Yeah, that's literally what I just talked about. Sorry. Uh, Jerry's freak out in the basement is great. His first freak out that he really has when Stephanie's down there getting the ice. It gives you the idea that, that he has a portion of himself stuck in his childhood because he starts yelling about like being a good boy and stuff like that. And then he talks about, no, we're going to keep this family together, basically. So he just like flips out. So you see like the rage portion of him. He's no longer calm. And then you just get these glimpses of his childhood. And so for that reason, I don't think they actually needed what was originally in the script in the beginning of showing parts of Jerry's childhood because they're, you're getting those pieces from his freak out. And, and if you're astute enough, which most people are, you're picking up on that while he's having his breakdown. And Stephanie is staring in horror, basically. It's kind of funny when, Jer when Jerry is flipping out and then he snaps out of it. This is another flip out time. He, it, he like kind of immediately snaps out of it when Susan yells down that dinner's almost ready. So it's, it's interesting because it shows you how much in his head he gets and how much he loses control and how much it actually kind of is like an entirely different mode of him. And something needs to happen to get him out of that like hyper-focused, violent killer mode. So another moment of setting it up well. I like how uh, the police officer that Ogilvy ends up talking to basically tells him to take matters into his own ham hands, uh, which is definitely not the type of thing that police officers should say to people, but for the purpose of the story, sets things into motion that needed to be set into motion that eventually gets a gun to Susan and Stephanie. Well, to Susan specifically, and that's how she's able to end Jerry's life to save Stephanie. Um, I would say that there are much less laborious uh, ways to get the gun to Susan, but it is actually kind of interesting because you think the whole portion of Og with Ogilvy is going to go a little bit further. In the end, he ends up not mattering that much, and literally the only p point of him is to get a gun to Susan. So in the end, it seems kind of dumb, but the journey was, was interesting enough with him. Uh-oh, once the therapist slips up and says, my wife, you know he's getting murdered. That part where he kind of tries to do some clandestine sneaking around to ask questions to Jerry while he poses a, as a bachelor and then slips up and calls himself a, uh, says he has a wife. Uh, yeah, he tries to backpedal out of that, but at that point as an audience member, you're just like, nope, you're done. He's killing you. You're, you're, you're done. So that that's a great moment. Jerry happily whist uh, bleh, Jerry happily whistling after blowing up the therapist in his car uh, just goes to show how murdering makes him feel good. Basically, this drives home that he is cold blooded. That that part of him that is nice and uh, looking for a family isn't the real part of him. It's it's fake. It's a facade. The real part of him. Uh, is ki the killer because he's whistling. He looks so happy and so upbeat after he murders, which makes him even more scary and chilling as a character. After the family fight about Jerry breaking up Stephanie's kiss, I love the shot of Jerry's face that's half in the dark and half in the light, which I think is kind of supposed to like symbolize the two sides of him, of like the public that's portion of him that's in the light that looks good and the part that's in the dark that only a very small amount of people see usually just his uh victims in essence so or near victims in this case so i j but i just love that shot because he like walks out into the the lawn and then he stops kind of in front of the camera and it's like half light half dark it just looked great and there are a bunch of those and you know to that speaking more to that the directing's really good in this the cinematography is well done acting's great like technically speaking it's really good the only thing I didn't really like but I can you know I can write it off as this is what happened around this time period in 1987 the music's not that great it did kind of sound like a made for tv movie of the time not so good score but you know that was kind of the time period uh it doesn't hold up but the rest of the film does I think is Ogilvy going to every house in Oak Ridge 
That was one of the questions that occurred to me because it literally seemed like Ogilvy was going to every single house, knocking on the door, and then wanting to see the man of the house. Uh, is that what he was doing? I don't know. That is a lot of work, but I guess he was very committed to catching this dude. Jerry changing his appearance and looking for a new job signals that he's about to kill Stephanie and Susan. This makes the intro portion of the film very important for signaling that to the audience that that is what is coming. It ups the stakes. It lets people, it doesn't just let people know, oh, something is potentially going to go bad. It lets the audience members know you already saw exactly where this is headed. And that gives you even more dread. It makes you even more scared for Susan and Stephanie because you don't just know something bad's going to happen. You know exactly what's going to happen. And you're thinking there's a high potential possibility that he's also getting away with it because he's been there before. He is very cool and calm about this and very calculated because obviously he's already got a new job. He's already got a new house. He's already scoped out a new woman and uh, with a daughter to move in on. He's, yeah, he's that guy. Great moment when Jerry says, next time, Jim, call before you drop by, after he stabbed Ogilvy. Um, just a great comedic moment, which there weren't very many comedic moments in this film. And it didn't actually, it didn't feel like it clashed, because a lot of the times injecting comedy into horror like this can kind of feel like a speed bump, and it just throws you out of it. It just, it went in there really well, and I, I appreciated that. It was pretty funny. I actually did laugh at that line. I don't laugh at a whole lot. And after taking him out, Stephanie symbolically tears down the house that Jerry built, aka the bird house. That is a symbolic movement or a symbolic action by Stephanie where she's, you know, sawing down that big pole that's holding that bird house that was built by Jerry because you see throughout the film different stages of him actually building that birdhouse. And that was his way of kind of building his house in the image he wanted. And that is why Stephanie, after everything's said and done, tears it down. And you have that final shot of it kind of on its side, partially smashed with their house in the background. Really good shot to end it on. This film really plays off the you never know who's living next door trope that has been in plenty of horror films. But I think this has done it very, very well. Other really good ones, I think, are like The Burbs. That's more heavy on comedy, obviously. Or Summer of 84 on Shudder. That's another one that kind of goes into that. Uh, it's this whole... I think that really started in the 80s when there started to be more reporting of like child abductions and stuff like that. Then people started societally to think, ooh, you really do never really know who's next door to you. And apparently, actually, the premise of Jer the character of Jerry going around and killing uh, families uh, was rooted in some actual event, I think that took place somewhere in New Jersey that Westlake had read about where a man had killed his entire family. Um, I didn't really look into many other aspects of it than that because that's all that's really important so the, there's some truth to it but this kind of you know obviously blows it way out of proportion and takes it somewhere else it also plays on the issue of children not really knowing who's being brought into the family when a parent finds a new partner and that's the thing i was talking about earlier where naturally a, a kid does not want some stranger literally to them some stranger just coming into their home and then just supposed you're supposed to trust them. Um, it's hard to do. Like trust needs to be earned, comfort needs to be earned, and the whole time you're thinking, I don't know who this person is. This isn't someone that I grew up with. I don't know where they've been, who they are as a person, how they were raised, any of this stuff. So it really bottles up all those questions and <laughs> gives you the worst possible answers. You know horror wise in this film and and i think that's why it's pretty pretty smartly written uh the intros intro uh intros neighborhood and the one in oak ridge actually look the same so take note of that they really did they set up the street to look exactly the same in the intro neighborhood where the first murder was and that in oak ridge uh this and jerry literally changing who he is uh gives you the idea people like this could be anywhere, which helps drive the impact of the terror for this audience, really giving you the idea, do you know who your neighbor is? Do you know really who that 
person who just moved in next to you actually is because they could be this person. You know, it really helps kind of ratchet the anxiety up of not knowing who people really are. And, you know, think about it, especially nowadays, I'm not trying to like freak people out, but nowadays, like you probably don't even really know your neighbors because everyone's so focused on individuality, especially because technology is very individualized. People are usually spending a lot of their time, you know, in front of their screens or online uh, doing individual stuff. And that's just kind of how we've moved as a society. So films like this, I think, are kind of primed to have more of a comeback right now because it takes the premise of not knowing who lives next door from a time in the 80s when people actually probably did know who was living next door, bring it to now, and you don't. Like, most people actually don't know who lives next door. So let's start having more of these types of films, and it'll scare people even more because they'd be like, uh, yeah, I really don't know my neighbors. Who are these people? Who's living next door to me right now? I don't know. So yeah, I think it's kind of ripe at this moment for that. Okay, so out of five stars with half stars in play, you know, this isn't the most phenomenal film. It is really quite solid, though. Um, I'm between four stars and three and a half stars. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it four stars. I'm going to go four stars. Be, and, and the main reason that I'm going to tip it to the four stars... I was feeling three and a half coming into this, but I'm going to tip it to four to four, just because it's a premise that sounds stupid. It's a premise that sounds boring, but the script and the filmmaking and the acting really did come together to make it a story that's actually scary. It's actually compelling, and the tension in this is great. So that's why I'm giving it a four star rating. Uh, I know a lot of people have told me you got to check out The Stepfather, and I was like, really? It just sounds kind of like a dumb premise, but I did, and I really liked it. So give me your thoughts on it. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Let's talk about it in the comments. I'd love to hear what, what everyone has to say about this one. Or, you know, we can just talk about horror stuff in general. But regardless, I thank you for checking this out. Do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you have, thank you very much, and know that I've seen that. Because every time someone subscribes, I get an email telling me that. I look at your profile and I think to myself, thank you, awesome person right here. Uh, and it does help motivate me to keep doing all these because I've been doing it for some years now. And sometimes, you know, you're a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like work at times. But for the most part, it's really fun, especially when you watch a really good movie like The Stepfather. But yeah, it helps to have encouragement. So please subscribe. I really appreciate that. Also hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I'm putting up any new videos so you can make sure to catch more reviews like this. Uh, some of my no spoiler reviews for newer films or unboxing videos, haul videos, all that jazz. Regardless though, like I said, I really do thank you for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.